South Africa is a naturally beautiful country and it is up to all of us to work together to keep it like this. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to this week's Anur the Light. Young Muslim professionals are impacting positively in all kinds of ways. As the job market continues to offer new and exciting roles, our brothers and sisters are rising up and making a mark for themselves. Our featured profile this week is on environmental champion Yusuf Raja. Hope you enjoy. Protecting the environment has become more important than ever as it is key to our survival as a species in the future. Industries across the board are investing human capital into making sure there will be something for the next generation, which in turn has led to a slew of new jobs. Yusuf Raja is passionate about saving the planet and he gets to do this on a daily basis. It all started with an opportunity that, that came about uh, with provincial government. Uh, and I got employed there um, many years ago now. Um, I've always had a passion for the environment. I think being, having a job where you wake up in the morning uh, excited about what you're going to do, seeing the, the benefit that you are making, whether it is on a specific project, whether it's to a community, whether it's to the environment, uh, is very satisfying. You know, working in a company that allows you to, to explore, innovate, find solutions, um, all of that is it's appealing. Ever since his days at the Department of Environmental Affairs, where he was part of the Green Scorpions, tasked with protecting the country's fauna and flora, Yusuf's commitment has been to protecting nature and all that comes with it. He since moved on from government but remains in his field of expertise, protecting the environment. Environmental management requires us and, and, and anybody that works in the built environment, it's about managing competing interests and finding a balance um, uh, between development, conservation, preservation. Uh, in many instances, that balance can be achieved with a bit of thought and, and application uh, and willingness from all parties uh, uh, to, to try to achieve a solution. We have to be sensitive to the needs of, of development and developers and to move the country forward, but it has to be done responsibly, um, uh, considering what the best outcome could be and all the different options that are available and in choosing the one that is best fits that particular site. So no two sites are the same. Um, and, and that's where the value comes in. Uh, uh, what risks are we trying to address, understand, mitigate, avoid? And what value are we bringing uh, to the developer, to the environment, to the project that we're working on? Yusuf is dynamic. He's well-read. He's well-spoken. He's very family-orientated. He, 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 he likes to understand the problem first before he comes up with a solution. So he's, he's, he's a, and he comes up with a lot uh, well thought of and very logical solutions to, to problems. We both work in the planning department of Wooden Arab and um, I'm a traffic engineer and he's an environmental consultant so we liaise quite often on, on mega projects, a wooden KZN, Kwazul Ratel and wooden uh, across the country. He's taken his position with the company to the next level in that he's, he's looking at environmental and looking at it from a, from a different perspective, not from a conventional environmental perspective. So he looks at it with the eye from, let's get understanding what the developer's intentions are. And I think that's what sets him apart from, from other environmental consultants. When a fire destroyed most of this factory, Yusuf's company got the tender to oversee the environmental impact assessment and ensure the new building adheres to strict green principles. We've been appointed to assist this facility with recovering from this unfortunate incident that happened a few months ago, which was a fire, uh, specifically from an environmental point of view in terms of remediation and cleaning up and responding to it in that way. Well, we've been on site now for about two months, um, and our role is one is to ensure that the remediation happens uh, in a responsible fashion, that we appoint the right people, we get the right contractors involved, um, and that we communicate our progress with the relevant authorities, keep them informed, and we have regular progress meetings, um, and uh, basically to to make sure that the recovery happens in a in, a, in an acceptable in an acceptable way from an environmental point of view. As a young Muslim, he is dedicated to his religion and puts this into practice by giving of his time, energy and expertise in recycling old containers into classrooms, mosques and libraries. This project is referred to, we call it the Mobile Musalla project. 
And uh, the concept started when a group of, of us uh, traveled to Jordan and Syria to have a look at the humanitarian issue there. And uh, we learned from some of the, the work that was done there in terms of uh, doing similar types of projects. Um, and we imported that thinking uh, to South Africa. Uh, and this is what the result of that is. At the moment, we, it's been used for madrasa classes, but it's also been used for salah facilities. And then also, because it's, um, it's such a prominent container, that uh, other organizations can use it for uh, medical distribution. So it becomes more of a community center. So for example, in Ramadan, we've got a program where we visit all the areas where we have containers, and we're going to be doing uh, winter warmth distribution. So we'll be doing blankets and beanies and that, and as well as, as hampers for the local community. So it's become more of a focal point in that, in that locality, uh, over and above the, uh, the, the madrasa classes and the salah that's been performed within it. Uh, we do this on a volunteer basis, and everybody in our organization does it on a volunteer basis. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a dual benefit in any of this work. One is there's a benefit of the giver, and then there's a benefit of the receiver. Yusuf is the type of person whose care and concern goes beyond his daily work and lives his religion through service in the name of Allah. I believe if I focus on adding value in whichever way I can, in whichever scenario I'm in or project I'm in, then that would in itself be an advertisement to others uh, to, to understand the importance of conservation, preservation, social work, and all of those things. Um, I think on an individual level, if you focus on that, the rest of it should take care of itself. Young people such as Yusuf give credit to not only this country, but also their religion as they continue to shine bright. Earth, or at least this part of it, has some hope for being taken care of through the work Yusuf does. He is another young person who is a credit to the South African Muslim community. I'm both excited and proud to see how my fellow countrymen treat our environment. After all, it is only one planet we have and it is up to all of us to do our little bit. Molana Zakaria Philanda is standing by with this week's Q&A. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Welcome to this segment on Annur Ayman and Zakaria Falanda. Our first question is from Facebook. If a woman doesn't want her husband to go into polygamy, is he still allowed to go ahead with it? Firstly, thank you for the question. Polygamy in Islam is allowed. It is based on the verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَانْكِحُوا مَا طَابَ لَكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَا مَثْنَا وَثُلَاثُ وَرُبَعْ Marry what pleases you of women, two, three, or four. But there's an important consideration in all of this. Further on in the verse, God Almighty says, فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَلَّا تَعْدِلُوا فَوَاحِدَةً If you are unable to be fair, then marry only one individual. If a woman feels that she is unable to be in a polygamous relationship, she can request of her husband not to go ahead with it. If she still feels that the husband is adamant to go ahead with it and she doesn't want to be in it, she can request a divorce. The next question asks us, according to Islam, is there a law for the amount of food that we as Muslims are allowed to consume? Most definitely there is a law. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kulu wa shabu wa la tusrifu. Eat and drink and do not go overboard. Inna Allah la yuhibbul musrifeen. Verily, God Almighty, He does not love those who exceeds the boundaries. So this is a rule in general, not only when it comes to the consumption of food and drink, but anything for that matter, whether it's based to our needs, our wants, our desires, we should never go overboard and never commit excesses. We should always try to follow a middle path. And this is with regard to food and drink, especially because it results in either good health or it can result in a bad state of health. The last question is, is it haram for a man to be a male model in a non-Muslim fashion industry due to the immodest attire that he's worn? There's a ruling with regard to modesty in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Tell the believing men that they should lower their gaze and they should protect their chastity. And then with regard to women, it says, And say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and they should protect their chastity. And that they should not make a display of themselves. So in this regard, when it comes to modeling, 
It is not allowed for a woman to put her body on display as an object, nor is it allowed for a male to put his body on display as an object. It doesn't really matter what type of clothing it is, but it is the entire concept of putting one's body on display as an object that could possibly create a sense of desire or a sense of want in another person. That is all that we have time for for today's segment. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Molana's responses are always measured and informative, and we'd like to thank him for making the time to answer these questions. Johannesburg is the location of our next story as we travel there to attend a historical conference which looks at how Muslims and civil society can impact, contribute, as well as implement government's national development plan. The contribution of Muslims to South Africa can be traced to the very first settlers who arrived here. They came as slaves, artisans, indentured laborers, traders and political exiles. In fact, some of the first political prisoners on Roman Island were Indonesian and Malay royalty who opposed Dutch occupation. Muslims have since been involved in almost every aspect of life in South Africa. I think we've, we are part of the fabric of South Africa. Uh, historically, the Muslim community has played a very strong role in the struggle for social justice. Um, and we need to really play a role in the post-democratic South Africa as well. So the role that we choose to play is the role that we'll have in the country. It's not a case of saying, you know, is there a role or isn't there? There is a role, but we need to step up and say we're going to fill that. The city of Johannesburg played host to a historical conference that looked at how Muslims can contribute to the National Development Plan under the auspices of the civil society movements. People from all walks of life were invited and the keynote speakers were leaders, change agents and future-focused individuals. We use the National Development Plan as a premise because that's a, a policy document that's been put forward by government giving a vision for the country for the next 15 years. And the feeling was that we need to engage with it as citizens and as civil society to understand what's in the plan and to look at ways that we as civil society can contribute to, to the broader uh, national development. A gala dinner kicked off events with Deputy President Cyril Ramaphosa delivering a pointed yet measured speech imposing the benefits and challenges of the adoption of the National Development Plan. Over the course of the weekend, delegates had an opportunity to interact with the themes of the National Development Plan through the various forums that were set up to deal with it. Uh, the conference was received very well. Uh, it opened up with a gala dinner on Friday night. And the keynote address at the gala was the Deputy President, Cyril Ramaphosa. Um, on Saturday was the real meat of the conference, which were the panel discussions. For the education, training and innovation panel, we had uh, Minister Nalea Di Pando on that panel along with Professor Farid Isak. We had on that panel Ahmed Sheikh and a few other individuals. You know, on the fighting corruption panel, Minister Praveen Gordon was the representative from government along with uh, Floyd Chivambo from the EFF and a, a few other panelists. It, it had a broad base of people who came from different sectors of society, government, labor, business, uh, Muslim civil society as well as broader civil society. Patrick M's involvement with the uh, with ASRI is we have found that there is a need in this country for our communities to work together. A lot of the times we find communities addressing government and they, they do so fragmentally. It's important for us to speak with one voice. The reason for ASRI is Petrochem has felt that uh, from a business perspective, from a community, civil society perspective, government needs to be engaged so the bridge between government and civil society is met. And this can only be initiated by a civil uh, society. No government can run without the interaction of civil society. Government can have a, the national development plan, what we are talking about, however, they can have consultants that assist them with the pilot projects. But if there is no interaction with civil society, nothing will happen effectively. 
The conference was a rousing success and the Owal Socio-Economic Institute that organised it had much to be proud of. The feedback was very positive from everybody who attended. Um, a lot of people or delegates who attended felt that ASRI should carry on and do more of this and, and many would like to be involved and engaged. Um, the message that we give is, you know, ASRI is not aiming to be a mess based organization or membership based organization. It's a think tank that focuses on these things. And individuals should go on in their own organizations or their own communities and take what they learned from the discussions and try to, to move forward in their own way as, as they see fit. Uh, Kulikani Mate said it very well in the last session. And he said, government isn't this building in Pretoria. You know, government is the clinic in your neighborhood, the police station in your neighborhood, the school in your neighborhood. And if as citizens we start putting pressure on those entities in our communities to ensure that they're accountable and they're providing decent services to the community, the pressure builds up to the, uh, to the region or to the province or to, the, to a national level where you know, citizens are making their voices heard and demanding uh, good quality, decent services for themselves in that community. Muslims have coexisted peacefully with other people of faith in South Africa. The contribution now to the National Development Plan ensures a continuing voice for this community and future generations. History has taught us that by being involved we won't get left behind. This has been the case and will continue to be through the work that ASRI is trying to do. From what I hear, this is only the start with many more engagements to follow. We have unique opportunities as Muslims in South Africa and our continued contribution has to be positively formulated. Our travel segment this week is in South Africa's playground by the sea, Durban. I can't wait. Apart from the sea, surf and sand, Durban has a whole lot more on offer. Take the N3 out of town, drive about 20 minutes and witness the spectacular valley of a thousand hills. This spectacular view is definitely on the list of many travellers as something to see. There are great vantage points along a stretch of the old main road between Durban and Pietermaritzburg and many cafes and restaurants to literally put your feet up. So the geological history of the Valley of a Thousand Hills is that we're on granite base. And what makes that beautiful and unique is that we get springs running all through the year. The rain falls in the summer months, settles down through the ground to the granite base, which then runs off and runs into the Bingham Ganey River in the background here. The Valley of a Thousand Hills is right next to Old Main Road, which is the old road running from Durban to Peter Marisburg, the road where the Conrad's Marathon is run. So as you're moving along the road, the view breaks open into the Valley of a Thousand Hills. So as you're traveling, doing what you want to do, visit curio shops, restaurants, etc., you will get these glimpses of the Valley of a Thousand Hills. What's nice about the Valley of a Thousand Hills is we're only 30 minutes from Durban. That's hot and humid. Up here, we lose that humidity. You can come all year round. In the winter, it's a bit drier and cooler. And in summer, the, moderate, the temperatures are still very moderate. The area has many cultural attractions, with the more famous being those associated with the Zulu Nation. For the traveller, there is much to see and do, and the valley can be done in literally a few hours, or why not make a day of it? Cool, hip and trendy places are on the rise, and Durban has a great selection of places to eat at. If you're in the mood for some hipster food, then head down to Lillian Ngoi for some scrumptious meals. The restaurants now, it's just over a year old. Well, majority Muslim customers, you know, um, but with the area now, it's starting to change a bit. We're getting some of the Indians, white people in. So it's, it's kind of growing. The signature dish, um, Portuguese chicken, chicken espetada, um, our classic beef burgers, um, half and half pizzas are very popular. Our gourmet classic burger, um, that's something that's grown this shop from where it was to where it is in the past few months. But people love it. Some people say it's the best burger in South Africa. It's sort of a chicken on a skewer, um, also served with salad. It's served with salad, pasta, chips. Depends, you know, what, uh, what other people want to taste. Most of the sauces are homemade and secret recipe. It's a mouth-watering treat that will leave one tantalizing for more. Pizzas and burgers are what people swear by and with good reason. I would encourage anyone to come here because we, we give a good service. Everybody's always on their toes. 
and mainly our passion is food. Moses Mabida Stadium has become one of Durban's crown jewels and with the city officials determined for it to not just be another white elephant, much is being done to keep it all going. Bungee jumping from the top has got to be one of the coolest experiences to have at the stadium apart from attending a sports event. It is currently the Guinness World Records World Tallest Swing. It's been um, certified as World Solar Swing by Guinness since 20, um, 2011, May 2011. The nature of the swing lends itself to quite a large, um, wide, wide demographic of people because um, we don't have age restrictions as such, we have weight limits. So a minimum 40 kgs, maximum 120 kgs. Um, we've had kids as young as eight years old do it and people um, as old as um, in their 80s do it. When people come to jump, uh, what makes it scarier over uh, skydiving and whatnot is because you come so much closer to the ground here. It's much more realistic. You can, you're overlooking the pit. You come nine meters off the ground. So you free fall for 80 meters and you come really close to the ground. Whereas with skydiving, it's very surreal. So that's the, different, that's the feedback that we get from our clients on the swing. The stadium's bungee jump is open daily and an ever-increasing list of people are ensuring its popularity as well as making the stadium financially viable. There's definitely something about the warm weather, blue sea and tropical climate that makes Durban so attractive to all. We're ending off this week's program with a local song by our world-famous and very talented Zane Bika. From me, Mara Mukwanda, Salang Hantle, Assalamu Alaikum. Hey, little bird, so way up high, light up the sky with your color design. Tell me who made you and I, me to walk and you to fly. The little bird said, that's my Lord, the little bird said, that's my Lord, the little bird said, that's my Lord, Allah, the creator of us all. Allahu Akbar, our creator, there's no one greater. Then Allah, so why do we stand tall? Too proud to recognize what's right before our eyes. Signs from the Lord. Hey alligator, lay so still. Who's your maker? By whose will do you crawl and do you swim? Who controls everything? The alligator said. That's my Lord, the alligator said. That's my Lord, the alligator said. That's my Lord, Allah, the creator of us all. Hey, king of the jungle, the mighty lion, top of the food chain, no denying. But who is the one that you rely on, life or death? Who is deciding, the lion said. That's my Lord, the lion said. That's my Lord, the lion said. That's my Lord, Allah, the creator of us all. Allahu Akbar, our creator. There's no one greater than Allah. So why do we stand tall? Too proud to recognize what's right before our eyes. Signs from the Lord. Hey, my brother, hey, my sister, see yourself as self-sustainer, but don't you see?